Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Ian Urquhart. Uh, I'm the Executive Director of Alberta Wilderness Association, and it's my pleasure uh, to welcome you to one of the 75 debates taking place tonight as this week, I suppose, as part of the 100 debates program. Uh, the program, if you are unfamiliar with it, is intended to make the environment an important issue in this federal election. And the program has sought to organize nonpartisan all candidates debates on the environment uh, tonight throughout this week from coast to coast to coast. Uh, AWA is pleased to host this debate in Calgary Confederation this evening. Uh, for any attendees who don't know us, um, AWA has been advocating on behalf of wildlife and wild spaces since we were formed around a kitchen table in Southern Alberta back in 1965. Uh, today, AWA has approximately 7,500 members and supporters. Uh, you can find us in 226 Alberta communities, as well as in communities elsewhere in Canada and, uh, and around the world. Uh, AWA has a healthy history of hosting events like tonight, of hosting all candidates forums in provincial and federal campaigns. And we're happy to be continuing that tonight and partnering with Green Pack for this evening's event. I'd like to start off by offering my thanks to a number of people who've made tonight possible. I'd like to start off with our staff, our AWA staff, Philip Meinsner, who did the heaviest lifting on this file for all of us uh, in terms of the organizing of the, of the event uh, this evening. Uh, Sean Nichols is our IT guru and he set up such essentials as the registration system for, for, for tonight. And Devin Earl and Carolyn Campbell were important sounding boards as Philip moved this project ahead. And they'll be helping out behind the scenes tonight as well. I also want to offer AWA special thanks to Judy Aldis, who should be no stranger to people attending our event this evening. Judy's the, the host of CBC's Alberta at Noon. Uh, and I want to thank her very much for being our moderator this evening. Uh, Judy has been a good friend of AWA over the years and has served as a moderator on more than one occasion for us in past all candidate forums that AWA has hosted. Uh, so candidates and audience beware. Uh, this isn't, in other words, Judy's first time at this rodeo. So uh, she, she, knows, she, she knows how to run a, 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 good and tight, uh, a good and tight ship to totally mix up metaphors. I mean, okay. Um, <laughs> Finally, I want to thank the candidates who joined us this evening, Edward Gow of the People's Party, Natalie Ott of the Greens, and Marie Sigler of the Liberal Party. Uh, the vast majority of people who run for public office, in my view, uh, deserve our respect and thanks for their willingness to serve the public, uh, irrespective of whether we agree on policy positions uh, or not. Uh, I'm sorry, though, to inform you that the, the New Democratic Party's uh, Gulshan actor the fourth candidate who we expected to be here this evening uh, had an accident and was forced to withdraw. Uh, I think she is recovering well, but uh, her need for medication and rest left her with no choice but to withdraw from tonight's event. Uh, I'm also disappointed, but not surprised, uh, to tell you that Lan Weber, the incumbent MP for Calgary Confederation, uh, informed us that he would be otherwise occupied this evening. Uh, I don't know what it is, but AWA seems to have this develop this unfortunate habit of always scheduling campaign debates on evenings where Mr. Weber is unavailable. Uh, with these remarks, and I invite you to consider carefully what the candidates here this evening have to say to you about environmental issues. Uh, I have no doubt that these issues will be the most significant ones we grapple with in this century, the most significant ones for the type of future we leave to our children and the spaces and species we care about. So with that, by way of introduction, I'm pleased to turn the evening over to our moderator, Judy, Judy Aldous. <laughs> Thank you, Ian. Thanks for that uh, introduction. And it's uh, nice to be here with you. Hello to everybody, wherever you are. Uh, you at home, at work, maybe you're even out for a bit of a walk this evening. Um, it's sort of one of the one of the joys I think of Zoom is that we're able to to uh, 
to connect, uh, to sort of meet you where you are. So I'm glad to have you with us. As Ian said, this isn't the first time I've been able to uh, be around for an AWA um, event. It, two years ago, in fact, we were together in the little house in, in Hillhurst to doing this. Uh, two years ago seems uh, like a lifetime ago. <laughs> it's been a long two years, uh, the pandemic, of course, but then, of course, uh, as well, I think the impacts of climate change. Now, I know for many of you who are with us tonight, this is long been front of mind, but I think for many other Canadians, uh, this has really been a, a year, a six months that it's really hit home, become sort of personal. The heat dome, summer floods, the drought. And in fact, if you look at a lot of the polls, uh, it's the top issue for Canadians going into this election. So, uh, you know, as Ian said, thanks to the three candidates for, for showing up tonight, for being willing to talk about this really critical issue uh, with us. So I can uh, sort of outline how the evening will go. Um, we're going to start with some opening remarks. The candidates will each have two minutes for those. And then uh, uh, Builder Wilderness has sort of divided the evening into three uh, main topic areas. Uh, they are climate change and biodiversity, Indigenous rights and reconciliation, climate leadership and collaboration. And so that's the, the questions will fall under each of those categories. Then we'll end off the evening with questions from you. Uh, I don't think I need to tell most of you about the chat function down there on the bottom of your screen. You can feel free to comment as you go along, ask the questions as they come up, as they come to your mind. You know, of course, with the regular caveats, keep them respectful, keep them on topic. Don't distract the debate, right? Make them sort of add to the debate. Um, and Philip uh, Meissner from uh, Alberta Wilderness will be monitoring that side of things. So we have uh, randomly selected the order in which panelists will speak. We'll shake up the order as we go along and hope to have you uh, out of here by nine. All right, so uh, yeah, the, the, the candidates themselves can see there's a timer that will appear. Uh, so uh, why don't we... Um, Get things started. We'll start with opening remarks. So again, each of the candidates has two minutes for these. And um, we will, the order that we've picked for these opening remarks is Edward Gao, uh, followed by Marie Sigler, and finally, Natalie Odd. So Edward, with the People's Party of Canada, why don't we uh, turn things over to you? Awesome, thanks, Judy. Um, so uh, just an introduction first. Uh, my name's Edward. I'm the People's Party of Canada candidate for Calgary Confederation here. And uh, um, so I, I guess a quick bio, I was born in Manitoba, and I actually grew up in Trailtown, PEI, and I've, I've lived in uh, many different uh, provinces in Canada, BC, uh, Ontario, New Brunswick, and, uh, and now Alberta. I actually moved here uh, six or seven years ago after my uh, um, bachelor's degree from uh, U of T in uh, mechanical engineering, and I've been working... Uh, as an engineer uh, in the oil and gas industry. And um, um, some of uh, my, my favorite hobby in uh, my spare time is uh, rock climbing. So I spend a lot of time outdoors. Uh, and of course, uh, care very much about the environment as do all of us uh, here in Canada. And, um, you know, I, uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, um, you know, uh, talking about the People's Party platform on the environment tonight. Um, just uh, by way of introducing our platform, um, I want to say that, you know, our platform is very much focused on uh, uh, improving the cleanliness of our air, water, and uh, soil. And uh, it's uh, not so much uh, focused on carbon dioxide emissions uh, uh, or carbon dioxide equivalents. Uh, and uh, so I can uh, definitely elaborate on that later. But uh, our approach definitely looks at the global context. So uh, we, we uh, look at uh, you know, uh, Canada and its role uh, in the world uh, in the context of many larger emitters like China and India. And uh, it's a human centric approach. So we look at it, uh, we don't want to, you know, even though more humans means more carbon dioxide, obviously we don't want to condemn people to energy poverty. So uh, uh, with that, I'll pass it back to Judy. The unmute. I'll get that down, I promise. All right, well, thank you for that, uh, Edward. We'll pass things over to Marie Sigler, the Liberal uh, Party of Canada. Marie is with us now, Marie.
You have to unmute as well, Murray. You see that top right? Are we able to do that for Murray or does that? Yeah, Sean, Sean, are we able there to? We there we go. I think we're good. It. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, but thank you very much, Ian. Congratulations on the great work you do. Uh, at this time of a health crisis in our province, I also, um, thinking of, of Grisham, I hope her health is, is good and we look forward to meeting her and, and, we're, and uh, working together for a common cause as we move forward. So sorry, Grisham, you couldn't make it tonight, but I hope you're listening. I hope you're, you're feeling better. Um, the, the, um, in terms of what, it, what, what the Liberal Party of Canada and I personally stand for, please see our media release that we posted this afternoon at 1 p.m. Uh, the Conservative Party of Canada and the UCP simply do not seem to grasp the magnitude of the climate crisis, nor do they understand uh, the, the, the urgency of climate action. Mr. Weber is a nice guy, but what has he actually accomplished in the past six, year, six years as our member of parliament? His silence during this campaign speaks for itself. Calgary, Alberta, and Canada need better. The Conservative Party, Aaron O'Toole, Len Weber, don't let them take Canada backwards. I've listened to thousands of our concerned constituents over the past and recent weeks and earlier. They understand. And I promise to be a strong voice to fight for all of us in Ottawa and to lead Calgary Confederation through this transition. I respect both the Green Party and the NDP. We are aligned on our core values and policies on change, laws, Indigenous rights, reconciliation, leadership, collaboration. So my promise is to be a strong and effective voice for all of us in Ottawa. Let's move forward together, not backwards, and together, together as a community, together as allies in a fight now. It's imperative for future generations. So let's work together. We share common values. I look forward to moving forward together. Great, thank you for that, Murray. Uh, Natalie, Natalie Odd with the Green Party. I'm gonna hand things over to you. You have two minutes. Thank you. So just making aware that um, we can't unmute ourselves. The host has to unmute us. Okay, great. Hello, everyone. Um, it's really great to be here. Hello, Edward, Murray, Kevin. It is great to see you again. I think this is our third time doing this together. And I do miss Dr. Actor being here. Um, uh, I think it's really important for women to be running for office. And I really appreciate any time there is another woman uh, up on the panel with me. So we're missing Dr. Actor this evening for that and many other reasons. I hope she's well. So my name is Natalie Odd. I'm the Greedy Party of Canada candidate in Calgary Confederation. This is my fourth election as a candidate, my third in this riding. And I'm running for the Green Party because of its values, ecological wisdom, sustainability, social justice, respect for diversity, nonviolence, and participatory participatory democracy, and also our approach to politics, which is uh, evidence and science-based. We examine and address root causes. We look at interconnectivity and ingenuity. And we are not told what to say or what to fight for, with some exceptions, such as reproductive rights. And we're here this evening to discuss some critical topics in the, elec in the election in our lives in Canada, including the climate crisis, the loss of biodiversity, Indigenous leadership, environmental racism and collaboration for solutions in the climate crisis. And these are issues that I work on year round in my role as executive director of the Alberta Environmental Network, which is a nonpartisan, nonprofit environmental organization. Uh, it's a social profit organization, if you will. It's a network of over 50 groups, growing number of individuals that collaborate to protect and preserve Alberta's ecosystems, which are our life support systems, air, water, diversity, climate. 
And this year in my role at AN, I've co-led three province-wide public engagement campaigns, Defend Alberta Parks, which successfully reversed the Alberta government's plan to close and delist 175 parks, Protect Our Water Alberta Beyond Coal, which is part of a large and diverse coalition to stop eight open pit coal mines in eastern slopes of the Rockies and headwaters for millions of people, and Draw Down Alberta, which is a solution-based movement um, for Albertans to research and crowd solve the most impactful and feasible climate solutions for Alberta. Great. Thank you, Natalie. And uh, thanks if you, so for those who are just sort of just joining us this evening. Uh, nice to have you with us. First of all, I see we've got, oh, uh, just north of 70 odd people, uh, participants uh, so far and more coming. So uh, nice to have you along for the evening. I'm Judy Aldis, by the way, CBC Radio. I host the Open Line show uh, that runs for, across the province every day. All right, well, we can get into some of the uh, topics uh, that Alberta Wilderness uh, is going asking the candidates to focus on this evening. So the first topic is climate change and biodiversity loss. Uh, COVID-19 has provided us with an opportunity to address our recovery from the pandemic in ways that also seek to address the climate crisis and biodiversity loss at the same time. So the following questions each deal with immediate measures the government can take to address these interlinked crises to protect the health of Canadians as we emerge from the worst of the pandemic. So I can read the specific question uh, and then we will have Natalie first uh, answer it followed by Edward and then Murray. So the question is what aspects of your party's platform seek to halt and reverse nature loss protect species at risk, and meet Canada's commitment to protect at least 30% of land, freshwater, and ocean by 2030. So each of the candidates has two minutes to answer that question. And again, Natalie, we'll uh, let you kick us off. It, thank you, Judy. And we could spend all day discussing that there is so much in that question. So I'm going to do my best to cover what's in our platform. As you can well imagine, the Greens are very, very focused on this issue. Uh, we think it's critical to life on our planet and life in our society. And currently biodiversity and ecosystems um, that we depend on are degrading rapidly. This is due to changes in land use, exploitation of natural systems, climate change, pollution, and invasive species. And our window of opportunity change course is closing within the next decade. So uh, Canada, as we know, has abundant resources. We have 20% of the Earth's wild forests, 24% of its wetlands, and almost one third of its stored lard land carbon. So some key nas uh, national policies that the Greens would like to put into place that would have significant direct and indirect environmental, economic, and social benefits to Canada are these. First, to protect and restore biodiversity and ecosystems. Second, to modernize the Canadian Environmental Protection Act to include a right to a healthy environment. Three, to develop and implement a national forest strategy. And fourth, to protect oceans and fresh water. And I'd like to say that all intrinsic to all of these are, res are to respect and uphold the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples, their treaties and conservation priorities, as well as to recognize the right to a healthy environment and to take action on environmental justice and racism while improving laws that protect people and nature from toxins and plastic pollutions. We need to reverse nature losses by protecting and effectively managing at least 30% of land and fresh water and 30% of ocean by 2030. We have had a target of 17% for a long time and we have not come close to that. And now the target is up to 30% and we have a lot more work to do. Uh, our Species at Risk Act needs to be threatened strengthened. Uh, it's not effective at the moment. It's far too politicized. It's under-resourced. And we are not incorporating Indigenous knowledge into the way that we're using the Species at Risk Act. Um, we also need a national water strategy. And my time is up there. Thanks for that, Natalie. There'll be, you know, I think time throughout the evening to sort of delve deeper into some of these issues. And of course, I see many of you are already sort of using the chat function. So feel free to comment as, as the conversation goes along. And and um, ask questions as well. All right, again, so uh, Edward, um, I'll, I'll just quickly repeat the question for you and then you can delve right in. It says, what aspects of your party's platform seek to halt and reverse nature loss, protect species at risk and meet Canada's commitment to protect at least 30% of land, freshwater and ocean by 2030? And do you have uh, two minutes? Awesome. 
So um, yeah, obviously important to protect uh, um, you know species at risk and nature loss. Um, and you know I think we're on the right track. Uh, we've seen our environment get uh, cleaner and cleaner um, over the last uh, you know uh, multiple decades. Obviously with uh, use of cleaner and cleaner fuels and, and better environmental standards. But uh, you know our focus uh, with the People's Party is uh, uh, to uh, uh, reduce pollution uh, in the environment and uh, um, make sure that uh, uh, ecosystems are, are healthier and uh, without, you know, uh, waste and, and uh, uh, what have you. So, you know, part of that uh, includes strengthening uh, property rights, but also uh, making sure that, uh, you know, uh, industrial development uh, takes into account the full life cycle of uh, projects. So uh, that includes, of course, remediation and, uh, and reclamation and, um, you know, a lot of, in some jurisdictions, we see these companies uh, lobby for, you know, caps on fines uh, due to damage to the environment and that sort of thing. And that's definitely something that we absolutely reject. Um, all costs uh, associated with environmental damage should, of course, be borne by, uh, by the polluters. Um, but uh, <clears throat> I want to stress also that there is a balance, you know, between... Uh, uh, protecting species at risk and development. It doesn't mean that <clears throat> uh, we'll have no development because uh, any development, of course, does uh, have an environmental impact. And uh, there is globally a lot of still poverty around the world. We're very privileged in Canada, but a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, different parts in the world are, are in energy poverty, right? So <clears throat> Canada being an energy rich country does have a role to play in that. And uh, we don't want to have a policy <clears throat> that puts the uh, ecosystem into stasis. And uh, um, I, I'll end it at that, my time's up. Thank you, Edward. Murray, we'll have you uh, take the stage now. Do you want me to reread the question or you feel like you, uh, you're good? You need to be unmuted again. Sean, are you able to do that? I think you're unmuted now. There we go. Thank you very much. No, I've got the question. Thanks, Judy. First, I want to say I totally agree with everything Natalie said. I totally endorse support her work. I have for a long time. And it's kudos to you, Natalie, for doing it. My colleague and co-member of my leadership team, Dr. David Swan, it, it, you know, I hope he's tuned in tonight, but he supports it well. He's been a long-term supporter. And he's seen over the decades how things have gotten worse, how funding has dropped. There is no enforcement. Uh, it has to be enforcement. My background also includes being an environmental lawyer. I practice environmental law. I've also been a diplomat in, in London, the largest embassy in the world. And I know what it means for Canada as well. So um, I, all I can say is that um, totally agree with you, Natalie. Um, we've got to move forward together. The Liberal Party of Canada's environmental platform is the most feasible solution, I think, to the climate uh, crisis, and I commit to deliver climate action when I'm elected. Um, examples can be eliminating thermal coal exports from the, for the electricity sector. And I think of the Northern Gateway Pipeline. Now, there's a great example of not respecting uh, the, the Indigenous people. It's talking of building a pipeline that's not even required to market, to taking it offshore, to have plastic, the risk of of, of, of pollution in our waters around Canada. That's the kind of thing that Aaron O'Toole, Len Weber and that crowd fight for. They don't have a clue what they're talking about. It's time they wake up and Canada needs it, Calgary needs it, and the world needs it. Thank you. Thank you, Murray. All right, um, we can move on to the, the next question. Um, and the order in which we'll have you answered is Edward, Murray, and then Natalie. Uh, the question is, how important do you feel it is to ensure that our pandemic recovery works to create a greener, more sustainable future for Canadians? And then what elements of your party's platform address this issue? So get pandemic recovery towards a greener, more sustainable uh, future. Edward uh, Gow with the People's Party of Canada. You have two minutes. 
Awesome. Yeah. So, you know, with the, co uh, the COVID pandemic, obviously we've seen a uh, uh, consumption uh, drop uh, globally and uh, uh, we do have a cleaner environment because of that, but I would say mostly because of uh, uh, pollution going down. And, uh, um, you know, I think that uh, if we want to look at, uh, you know, um, um, a greener and more sustainable future, you know, um, Canada does have a role to play in that by uh, exporting our uh, energy, uh, uh, which has among the highest environmental and ethical standards in the world. And so when we look at uh, big uh, energy consumers like China and India, which still run on uh, coal for the most part, right? And so uh, looking at what Canada can do to create a greener and more sustainable future, you know, exporting our fuels to uh, to China is a very very quick and easy way to uh, uh, to do that. And uh, you know, a lot of these coal plants can be converted to uh, natural gas fired plants, which does have almost half of the carbon intensity uh, of of coal. So um, uh, I think that's you know, if we look at the amount of carbon emissions we can reduce in Canada through the carbon tax and, and all these policies that don't really seem to work, uh, that's far outweighed by the impact of um, uh, what we can do with our, uh, our energy exports. Um, but also I want to add that you know, globally, um, what we do see uh, among countries is as a country becomes more developed, people care more about the environment, right? And so just according to the Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs, you know, if people aren't starving and trying to put food on the table, they, they care about their surroundings. And so uh, making sure that people aren't in energy poverty and, uh, and uh, have access to cheap and clean uh, energy and uh, uh, um, energy with, uh, that's produced uh, responsibly is important as well. Thank you, Edward. All right, Murray, uh, the Liberal Party of Canada will pass uh, things over to you. So what elements of your party's platform address the issue of pandemic recovery, working to create a, a green or more sustainable future? Two All minutes. elements, thank you, thank you, Judy. All elements of our platform are interrelated. We believe in the futures with people. People start with health. They start with health, healthy lifestyles. They start with good health. They start with clean air. They start with initiatives like Green Line in Calgary. They start with bike paths in our city. I've been a, on the board of Parks Foundation Calgary. I've been chair of the committee that, that funds playgrounds throughout our city. That's a start. I know going uh, canvassing through our neighborhood this past weekend, all throughout our constitu constituency, people are out in the mountains enjoying enjoying the highwood pass or trying to look for larches or a bit early uh, but but they're out there with their families active living good health you got to have that to, to build the kind of community where we'll all want to live we will invest in people you got to invest in health in order to succeed with with, with all, all other initiatives and that means investing in all of the themes the topics that that are covered here tonight we support them we're the most comprehensive again i'd ask everybody to look at them, please post it on our website this afternoon at 1 p.m. You'll know where I stand for, what the Liberal Party of Calgary stands for, and where where uh, my commitment to everybody, including my the candidates in this room, and I say it at the doors. I promise when I'm elected member of parliament, I'll be a voice for everybody in our community, whether they voted for me or not, because our core values need to be fought for, and I'll be there to fight for them effectively. When I'm elected, I'll 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 also I'll also certainly speak for everybody I've heard at the doorsteps and including the, uh, Natalie, the NDP, other progressive parties that also share these core values. So, and the measures are, are needed. Carbon tax is required. And again, Alberta makes Calgary an outlier. That's an embarrassment for Canada on the world stage. It's an embarrassment for everybody in our constituency. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Murray. All right, Natalie Odd with the Green Party. We yeah, uh, have passed things over to you. Thanks, Judy. I'm going to try and get this. This is a lot to cover in two minutes. And um, first of all, I, I, I would like to say that we desperately need electoral reform so that we can 
hold the parties accountable to their climate change targets. We have not been meeting our targets. The UK, the, the European Union are way ahead of us on targets and achieving those targets. Canada is way behind. Uh, Canada's emissions are 21% above 1990 levels. We've never achieved a climate target. We have um, an emissions reduction target that is well below our global peers. And GHGs have risen every single year since 2016. Um, our government, our federal government bought a pipeline and has increased subsidies to fossil fuels. We're now at $18 billion to fossil fuels, which is more that we're putting, than the government is putting into its climate action plan. You cannot have it both ways. So um, we need to limit climate change. We need to achieve net zero emissions as quickly as possible. And the Green Party is championing 60% reduction from 2005 levels by 2030 with clear enforceable targets and timelines. And we need to achieve this as quickly as possible and aim for net negative in 2050. We need to end all extraction of fossil fuels. That means canceling new pipelines, new oil exploration, end leasing on federal lands, ban hydraulic, and end subsidies to the fossil fuel sector. Uh, we need green innovation, a just transition through new renewable energy. This was promised by the, um, the Liberal government that they would have a Just Transition Act, and we've been waiting six years. It hasn't happened. They've just started consultation on it. It's, we are running out of time. And I'm sorry, Edward, but um, natural gas is also a fossil fuel, and the International Energy Agency has said we have to phase them out starting right away. Uh, we need to enact a detailed carbon budget and accelerate an increase into carbon taxes and introduce a carbon border adjustment among many other things. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, and a lot of what you just brought up will, will sort of feed into sort of the next section. And so we're gonna do things a, a little bit differently in this next bit. It's a sort of a bit of a rapid fire round. I have three very specific questions. They're essentially yes or no questions. We'll give you 30 seconds, but feel free to be faster than that. Your answer just might be a quick yes or a quick no. Uh, and so we'll just go through each question, have each of, of you quickly answer it. So the first question is, will you support a ban on new coal mining projects along Alberta's eastern slopes? Murray Sigler, will you support a ban? Yes, emphatically yes. Number one priority, yes. All right, as we said, didn't need to take 30 seconds if you don't want to. All right, so Natalie Odd, will you support a ban on new coal mining projects on the eastern slopes? Not only do I 1000% support a ban on those slopes, I've been working tirelessly uh, for the last few months on Protect Our Water Alberta Beyond Coal campaign. We have been going door to door to hundreds of thousands of homes with a large group of volunteers, many of whom have joined us tonight. Um, this should never have happened in the first place. We have First Nations that are trying to get the attention of the federal government to ensure that we don't have to keep battling these projects one at a time because they're releasing selenium into the water source for millions of people. But other than that, it's having an impact on um, the livelihood of First Nations, of our ecosystem here. And there's so many cumulative impacts from mining. All right, that we Natalie, really I'm to gonna jump in. This. Just this was this was a real rapid fire section. So I think we'll, we'll leave it there for now. But Edward, we'll pass things over uh, to you. Will you and your party support a ban on new coal mining projects along the Eastern Slopes? Yeah, so the answer is no, we would not. And again, you know, this is about <clears throat> responsible development, not uh, no development, right? So. There's a responsible way to do that. And setting aside the question of jurisdiction on whether or not the federal government would have jurisdiction to do that, uh, you know, we, we know that coal is used in a lot of things, not only for energy, but for steel making, for example. So a lot of important considerations. And one of the key considerations would be if these companies can uh, provide a plan for uh, reclamation and uh, recovery of those uh, of the uh, site after after the mining. Okay. All right, Edward, we'll leave it there. And uh, Murray. Ah, Murray, we already heard from you. Right, we won't get you to answer again. Okay, we'll move on to the next question. Uh, the next question, again, same format, you know, quick 30 second at the most answers. Will your party legislate to require all sectors to reduce carbon emissions by 60% by 2030? Edward, we'll let you have uh, first go with that one. So the answer to that is no, we would not. Um, <clears throat> I think this kind of comes out of uh, a lot of climate alarmism that uh, is, uh, um, you know, um, 
um, bringing itself into into politics. But uh, with carbon emissions, you know, we have seen uh, carbon dioxide concentrations and temperature much higher in the past. Uh, uh, and so uh, if we look back hundreds of millions of years and so reducing carbon emissions, you know, that that will increase the cost of living and doing business in Canada. And on top of that, it will uh, lead to the death of many people in uh, third world and uh, developing countries. And so okay. it's... Uh, I'll jump in there, Edward. We're just trying to keep these ones pretty tight, uh, but we'll pass things over to uh, Murray Sigler. Again, will you, the Liberal Party require all sectors to reduce carbon emissions by 60% within nine years? We definitely will require all sectors to reduce their emissions. Canada cannot meet its 2050 targets uh, without moving as aggressively as we can. Um, we, we believe there's a time for transition. We are moving in a direction as aggressively as we can. Uh, so can I jump in? So the, is it the 2030 timeline that, you, that the party won't commit to? Won't commit for all sectors. It's complex. I'd like to get more into it, but I promise I'll give voice and advocate for it where it makes sense. It might make sense for agriculture more readily than a transition for, for the energy sector, which may take some more time for an order to transition. All right, Natalie Odd, we'll give you uh, 30 seconds to answer the question. Yeah, the Green Party's uh, target is 60% um, reduction from 2005 levels by 2030, and we must do it. it it's, there's no room for negotiation here. This is science-based. This has been studied for a very long time. Um, and the Liberal and Conservative governments have known about this for 60 years or 40 years and um, have not made progress on this at all. So when I hear more delay and the Climate Accountability Act doesn't have these milestones in it, it's drawn out, it's not binding. So we need something more. All right, thank you, Natalie. All right, we have one more question in sort of our rapid fire section here. Uh, the question is, will you push your party's leadership to end all government subsidies for fossil fuels? Natalie, don't, uh, don't mute yourself again, because we'll get you to, to start off. And again, you have just maximum 30 seconds to answer this. Mm -hmm. uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the federal government has provided $18 billion in fossil fuel subsidies and less than that for our climate action plan. We need to limit those completely. If you know the oil and gas sector is so wealthy, one of the wealthiest industries on the planet, why would you need to subsidize it? We need to, to let renewables prosper and put that money into building our renewable electrified grid across the country. So absolutely end those fossil fuel subsidies. And we keep hearing it'll happen and it hasn't happened. All right, Edward, we'll let you have your, your 30 seconds now. Yeah, so the answer to the question is yes, we would. And even further to that, we would end all subsidies for all corporations across the board. So uh, our party is actually the only party that has committed to that. All the other parties do support uh, corporate welfare, either bailouts or subsidies of some kind. And, uh, you know, it's really no surprise when the liberals and conservatives are, are in fact, their top donors are both the same, in fact. And so, you know, uh, this is about creating an even playing field for all businesses. Businesses exist to serve consumers, not the other way around. Thank you, uh, Edward. Um, Murray, will you push your party's leadership to end all government subsidies for fossil fuels? Yes, I will. And the difference between our party and the others, we actually have a budget that was approved by the Parliamentary Budget Office before the election was, was called. There's a five-year budget that provides for all the programs we have in mind. So definitely eliminate subsidies, but that doesn't mean no, don't invest shrewdly and wisely in infrastructure that, that, that are required to make it happen more quickly. And the cost of those is actually built in our budget and our budget will, have, will, will be a balanced one. It'll be built on growth, investing in people, infrastructure that pays back. All right, well, thank you. And um, that sort of comes, brings us to the end of that, that section, the sort of quick yes or no part of uh, the, the, uh, the evening tonight. So we'll move on. Just a little note that if you, you have questions that sort of spring to mind, you can either just sort of hold on to them or feel free to add your questions relevant to what you're hearing today. Uh, you can put them in the chat function right now. Uh, Philip from AWA is monitoring all that, and then he can sort of collect them, and we can put your questions to the candidates later in the evening. 
All right, but uh, now we will move on to Indigenous rights and reconciliation. Uh, indigenous people play a critical role in environmental solutions and are disproportionately harmed by the impacts of climate change. So the question that we have for each of the candidates tonight is, will your party invest in indigenous led land use planning and the establishment of indigenous protected and conserved zones? We will uh, give you each two minutes and Murray Sigler will uh, let you have the floor first. The answer is yes, a thousand percent yes, to quote, uh, to quote Natalie earlier, like we're, 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 that's, that's central to it. We got to respect uh, Indigenous people and their land rights and their land heritage. Um, we actually believe there should be a national holiday called Truth and Reconciliation Day. Like, I haven't heard from Mr. Weber about that. I think he's still wondering whether we should have Labor Day. Like, I really, they're, they're like, I just, they don't get it in terms of the core values. So definitely, yes, the Indigenous uh, uh, groups within our province, within our country, internationally deserve respect. They deserve opportunity. And they're fine stewards, excellent stewards of their land. They have rights. They have they have responsibilities, and we should be supportive. Uh, we should be supportive of them as, as nations and as, a, as an order of government, uh, to use our imperialistic terms, government, to be supportive of their land rights and their, their ability and capacity to manage their own futures, their own lands. I think that's all I want there to we, say. Yeah, that's good. Sorry, took me a second to unmute myself there, but thank you for that, uh, uh, Murray. All right, um, we'll pass things over to Natalie Odd. Uh, Natalie, you have uh, two minutes. Great, thank you. So um, yes, definitely supportive of the Indigenous protected areas and conservation areas, and very happy to see that the federal government has been investing in this. Um, I commend them for that. And just recently, $340 million was committed to support Indigenous uh, guardians and protected areas and conservation areas. So that's really fantastic. There are uh, 27 of these areas now and about 25 um, that are in the planning stages, which is fantastic. Um, the Greens would would increase funding for this dramatically. Just to put it into context, there are over, you know, six, there are 624 First Nations communities in Canada. And uh, we would like to invest in each one of those communities having a protected area or conservation area. So you can see that we need to scale this up by quite a lot. Um, if right now we're in just about 50 communities, it's, it's phenomenal work. And um, this is about climate action and diversity as well as you know protecting really important areas uh, for climate action we do need land sinks and that is what is in effect here this is a nature based solution and these are creating conservation based jobs which are so it creates like a win 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 situation um, for everyone so I, I think the our return on investment, if you will, is tremendous. And this is something that I just really want to get behind and support. And more people should know about the tremendous work um, that's going on. And that um, on our planet, you know, um, Indigenous people account for 5% of the population, but they're managing 20, 20 to 25% of the land. And, and on that land is up to 80% of our biodiversity. So we know who the experts are here and we need to keep working together and learning together. So thank you. Thank you, Natalie. All right, uh, uh, Edward, we'll hand things over to you. And again, the question is, will your party invest in indigenous led land use planning and the establishment of indigenous protected and conserved areas? Two minutes yeah, for so, Thanks, Judy. So yeah, a very complex issue. And uh, on this uh, topic, we have a, a full policy uh, on our website uh, regarding this. Uh, I think we're the only party here that has actually stated that we would look at uh, uh, options to uh, completely repeal the Indian Act, uh, which uh, we view as a, uh, a essentially a, a very paternalistic uh, uh, piece of legisl legislation that has created uh, a, a basically dependency of the First Nations uh, on the government. And uh, so, you know, 
it's not about uh, throwing money at the problem here. Um, there's, there's been, of course, you know, it does require investment, but there has been so much money thrown at this problem and it has not been resolved. And we need reform of the actual approach to this problem. And so we're the only party that kind of has proposed that sort of reform um, that's uh, very much needed. And uh, the, uh, the reform, what it's aimed at is uh, establishing um, uh, self-reliance and uh, first and foremost property rights, you know, on these uh, on Indian reserves. Um, first Nations don't even have control over their own property in, uh, on these reserves. So uh, it's a very big issue and uh, we need to build the pillars that creates economic success first before throwing money at the problem. And, uh, you know, a part of that is uh, reforming the whole, oh, the whole, um, you know, way that uh, the relationship between First Nations and our government. And so establishing property rights, uh, making sure that uh, there is, of course, uh, ownership of services that uh, 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 take place on, on these, uh, these uh, reserves by First Nations, rather than just a, a top-down uh, government sort of program that, uh, um, you know, um, does something in a community and then uh, goes away and doesn't really provide any concrete improvement into the future. And I'll uh, leave it at that. Great, thank you. Thank you, Edward. And thanks to all three of you for keeping to time so so well, it's, uh, it's great. Okay, uh, we'll move on to uh, the topic now is climate leadership and collaboration. And the, the very specific question is, in the event of another minority government, Parties will be forced to collaborate on solutions to the climate crisis. What policy recommendations do you think should form the basis of that collaboration? And uh, Marie Sigler, we'll let you have the have the, the forum for two minutes. Thank you. Um, for, for sure, we're all about collaboration and working together. Uh, I'd say whether people voted for me or for Liberal or not, when I when I'm in Ottawa, I will be bringing forward an agenda that recognizes the need to move forward as aggressively, as quickly as we can. Um, I personally believe we should we, we need a majority government, and I believe it for Calgary's point of view. It's not. I believe we need certainty and clarity. There's a lot of complex social issues, financial issues, other issues facing us, facing our peoples, facing our communities, facing the world. We cannot move forward with uncertainty. We need clarity. We need we need some certainty going going forward. Like Edward, you just mentioned a few minutes ago about the complexity of uh, of the uh, Indian Act, for example, and that, that's not a simplistic analysis that has to be done. It's quite complicated. You know, I would back when I was a young law student, I was doing work on that. You know, whether and abolishing the Indian Act. Well, the fact is, a lot of Indigenous people have concerns about how that should take place. It can't be solved with the risk of parliament uh, being dissolved at any, in any time. And as I say, we've got to move forward. We've got to move forward together. Um, we need a common voice to, to, to make that effective. And uh, that's what I intend to bring forward in collaboration with everybody, uh, my colleagues that are on the progressive side of the column at least, uh, Natalie, the NDP, others, that, so we can make it happen. So that's my promise. And we need to do that together in Parliament. And I'll do that no matter what form of Parliament we have. But I sure would prefer a majority government to that we can actually address complex issues. We've got facts and figures. Natalie and this Ian's group, they've got a lot of facts and figures. And I need time to digest them, to articulate them effectively. Let's move together forward and make it happen. Thank you, Barry. All right, Edward, uh, Edward Gow. You're up next, you have two minutes. Yeah, so I think that, uh, you know, in terms of collaboration, yeah, you know, it, it, we, we obviously would collaborate with uh, other parties on the environment. Uh, in terms of the climate crisis, I think it's important to uh, avoid, uh, um, um, you know, an alarmist approach to this issue. Um, we need to obviously uh, have responsible development and not, uh, not a no development approach. And uh, one of, I want to emphasize again, one of the um, most impactful ways we can 
address the environment and the pollution and even uh, um, greenhouse gas emissions is uh, economic development. And we know that people care more about the environment as they do better. And, you know, Canada is a minority. We're, we're very privileged in this country uh, economically compared to the rest of the world. And so uh, we have to look at this not with a narrow uh, um, approach where we're trying to reduce our emissions and uh, um, negatively impacting uh, the development of, of many people across the world. It's important to look at this in a global context. And uh, you know, I think that uh, the fastest way to clean up the environment really is to uh, uh, export our uh, energy, which is developed to the highest environmental and uh, ethical standards uh, in the world. And um, uh, you know, we might have seen that statistic: uh, ninety percent of pollution into the ocean is from ten rivers, and they're they're all from developing or uh, uh, underdeveloped nations. And so, this is a very very uh, um, impactful way that. Uh, uh, an important role that Canada can play in uh, in um, addressing issues with the environment globally. Thank you, and thank you to uh, all three of you for your your answers, your thoughtful answers. Um, me, sorry, Judy, I haven't been able yeah. to answer that one. Okay, sorry, Natalie. It's okay. <laughs> Thank all you. Right. I'm glad you. I'm glad you quickly unmuted yourself. Yes. All right, Natalie. Yeah. You so, minutes. collaborating on solutions for the climate crisis. So, um, I actually believe that the Canadian population is way ahead of our government on this. Uh, we have been demanding action, particularly young people have been demanding action on climate for a long time. And I would have never have guessed when I first ran in 2008 that we would still be where we are today in 2021 with so little progress. Um, and actually, I believe a lot of Canadians also would like to see a minority government so that we do need to collaborate on this. Over a million people voted for Greens in the last election, and that's because they, are, they actually are alarmed about climate change. That's what's alarming is the lack of action. Um, in the new, in the new um, government, which, you know, if we did have electoral reform as we were promised in 2015, you would see a different makeup of government and you would see people who would be pushing accountability on climate action, pushing the targets, pushing the science and the evidence that we need to work with. So uh, what we really need to have is an all party cabinet, um, a climate cabinet that is focused on this all the time and updating the Canadian public regularly, just as we were doing with COVID, telling them where we're making progress in the different sectors. And to Murray's point, some of them are far more challenging than others, but that doesn't mean we don't have to double and triple down and make this happen. And the way you make it happen is you have the right minds and ideas at the table. You have your best minds and ideas. And that means not blocking out small parties with innovative ideas. It also um, means having all levels of government there, including municipal government, where a lot of climate action happens, all the provinces, full partnership with Indigenous people. Um, we have to move swiftly. And I'd also like to add that we need to have students and young people there. And, and to that point, we need to eliminate tuition to students. We need to eliminate their debt so they can focus on the problems that we most need to solve. Because right now, they are crushed under debt and mental health issues, and they aren't able to apply themselves to this. We need everyone together. And we just are, are way down under our antiquated electoral system. And finally, and I really would like 10 seconds to say this, we have a systematic refusal on the part of our government to recognize and respect Indigenous title and rights, free, prior, and informed cons consent, especially with fossil fuel projects. And that's why you're seeing uh, protests ramp up um, for Northern Gateway, but also for Trans Mountain Pipeline. Thank you, Natalie. And thank you to, uh, to all three of you. Hi, so Judy. It, it, yeah, I'm just sure. Gonna... I'm just going to interject here just for one moment. We uh, we did yeah. miss over one question in the Indigenous Rights and Reconciliation section. Um, we only covered the first question there. So I uh, I yeah, think sure. we, since we have time, we should pivot back to that before the audience questions. That sounds good. OK, yeah. I can. I, that's the what will your party do to address how yes. Indigenous people? Right. OK, my bad. OK, so the question is, uh, what will your party do to address how Indigenous people and other marginalized groups have been disproportionately affected by environmental crises? Uh, Natalie, I'll let you answer that one first. Thank you. Um, so we absolutely need to enact a right to a healthy environment in the Canadian environmental and 
Assessment Act. And we have a toxic pattern in this country that's environmental racism. And I don't think people are really aware of what's going on, but there's toxic dumps, including mer mercury poisoning, industry, land use and chemical emissions, water contaminants, tainted drinking water, soil contamination, pipelines in sensitive areas. And these directly impact indigenous, black and racialized communities, recent immigrants and people with low income. Um, they will also feel the climate impacts more intensely and sooner. And some of these impacts include asthma, reproductive effects, learning disabilities, cancer, and also the ability to grow food and um, have food sovereignty. So we need to swiftly implement the national strategy for respecting environmental racism and environmental justice act, which requires the development of a strategy on environmental racism and environmental justice. And this is long overdue legislation. It's been uh, done in the States for over 30 years. And I want to commend liberal MP Lenore Zen of Cumberland Colchester for introducing this bill in 2020 and working with a lot of other people to, um, to develop this and make sure that we're getting the information and statistics at the level we need so we can uh, identify these environmental hazards and the link between race and socioeconomic status and environmental risk as well as health outcomes. Um, and I want to acknowledge the National Anti-Environmental Racism Coalition for their work, uh, Ingrid Waldron, and also uh, Naolo Charles from, um, uh, sorry, Ingrid is from Enrich, and Naolo Charles is from the Black Environmental Initiative, to, and they're mobilizing environmental um, groups and social groups to do this. And it's so important. And I also want to say the role of a guaranteed living income so people don't have to compromise their health because of where they're going to live. Um, there's a lot of social supports that could offset a lot of this problem, but I think it's been long ignored and that this federal government has to act on it right away. Thank you, Natalie. Um, it, and, uh, and most of you probably have seen this already, but Philip uh, from AWA has been putting the questions in the chat, so it's nice for you to be able to sort of refer back to, to the topic. Uh, uh, Murray uh, Sigler with the Liberals will let you have uh, two minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, once again, I find myself totally agreeing with Natalie. I think, I hope that's a good thing. I believe it is because there's a lot of thought and work that's gone into it. So yes, I'll be a voice and uh, stand up for the national strategy um, for addressing, like, like she's mentioned, it's, I'll, I'll be supporting that. I'll be bringing that forward to, to my colleagues, hopefully in cabinet, but my colleagues in Ottawa. Um, there is a right to a healthy environment, as you say. Um, we must end all kinds of racism, including environmental racism that's entrenched and institutionalized in so many ways and so many pieces of legislation and so many attitudes even. So that's why we need representation, you know, from young people, uh, from, 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 uh, from, from, from females, from, from, from an inclusive approach. And we believe in an inclusive strategy for investing in the future. And we're investing in, in an inclusive society because that's, that's not just Calgary or Calgary Confederation. That's just Alberta, that is the world. And if Canada can show best practices and uh, provide those kind of opportunities, then we'll stand out in the world for best practices and we'll be proud of our country. And that, guess what? If we stand out in that way, Canada is going to grow and prosper because of our investment in people. And that includes um, clean water and includes environmental consultation processes being about meaningful ones being entrenched in legislation. It involves food. Um, uh, food solutions, as you say, it involves education, maybe more than a big element of that is education. It starts with, with uh, education and, and preschool. It goes right through post-secondaries and beyond. It's like lifelong education. That's why we support childcare for women, because that's a way to invest in people and provide opportunities. And we should have that in our province, and that should include everybody. And Canada would be proud of it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, it is uh, about 10 minutes after sorry, eight. Judy, could yeah. I get uh, my input as well here? Yeah, sure. I'm sorry, Edward. I, <laughs> I, I don't yeah, mean to, no I don't mean to be doing that. No worries at all. <laughs> of course you have, it's a good, good thing. Good, good thing. You guys are on top of this. All right. Yes. Edward. Yeah. So, uh, you know, in terms of uh, indigenous people, uh, 
Uh, in particular, uh, I would point again to our platform on reforming the Indian Act, and more generally for other uh, disadvantaged uh, individuals, is uh, uh, economic development in general, right? So we need to have policies that uh, enables uh, prosperity in these communities. And, um, um, you know, in terms of uh, uh, what comes out of that, obviously people are better able to adapt to uh, any sort of crises that comes their way with uh, um, uh, being better um, economically situated. Um, but uh, also, you know, stronger private property rights and, uh, and uh, you know, property uh, in, in general. Uh, and the enforcement of uh, stricter pollution laws. So, you know, Natalie mentioned a lot of uh, uh, good points on uh, these dumps and, and chemical pollution, and uh, that's very, very important to address. That's in fact our, our priority and uh, uh, on the environment. And, uh, you know, um, uh, we're, I think the, uh, our party has the strongest p position on uh, the economy. Uh, we have uh, proposed uh, measures to reduce inflation to zero and also to balance the budget within our first term. So uh, all very important uh, measures to uh, have a sound uh, economy. And uh, I think we can all agree that if Canada's economy fell apart, uh, we would see uh, worse environmental outcomes. And, uh, you know, finally, one last point that I wanted to throw out there is, uh, uh, aside from pollution, if we look at uh, deaths per capita due to uh, the climate, climate related deaths per capita that has declined, in fact, it's at an all time low in history. So we know that economic development works uh, uh, in protecting individuals from uh, climate uh, issues. And uh, that's, uh, that's, you know, tried and true. Thank you. All right, uh, I think we're ready for the question and answer uh, portion of tonight's event. So this is where you can uh, ask questions. I assume, uh, Philip, yeah, uh, I've been from collecting. Alberta Welders has been, yeah, you wanna take over this yeah, portion? Yeah, You've been so I'll, that? Um, I'll ask the, I can just ask the questions as they've been sort of dropped into the chat bar, um, sort of a first come first serve type of situation. Um, for some of the questions, I've had to ask for clarity with the, uh, the person who has asked. So um, just that saves you, Judy, from having to go through and read and pick through. So um, this was a question for all candidates um, regarding subsidies. So the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report uh, highlighted the link between animal agriculture and greenhouse gas emissions. Do you and your party acknowledge the severe effect animal agriculture is having on our environment? And if so, would you support moving subsidies for animal-based agriculture to climate-friendly plant food industries, uh, helping farmers to transition to environmentally friendly farming? Um, we can just start with um, any candidate here. I see Natalie, you're unmuted. If you wanna just go first there. Okay, so that was a really long question. Can you repeat it? Yeah, I make sure generally, that... generally, uh, do you acknowledge the effect animal mm -hmm. agriculture is having on the environment? And would you support uh, moving subsidies for animal agriculture to climate friendly plant food industries? Yeah, I, I mean, we have a lot of um, industrial farming and we need to support regenerative agriculture and use different techniques. So. I would, I, I think we have to be very careful where we put our subsidies and do they have the, um, the impacts and outcomes that we want them to have. So for climate change, that's a really big one. Agriculture is really, really important. Um, and there's a lot of people that are experts in this and there are ways to reduce um, emissions in this field. So I do think we should take a really close look at what the practices are in agriculture and shift them, yeah. Great. Uh, we can just move to any other candidate. Do you want to go, Murray? Uh, yes, please. Am I unmuted? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, we support it. Um, uh, the plant initiative we've actually put in place is the Liberal government, uh, the Plant Protein Alliance, which the, the UCP cut, chopped all the funding for. 
uh, after it was established, it was a consortium involving some of the main players in the industry in Western Canada. It was based in Alberta. The UCP government chopped its funding. There's an example of what shouldn't happen, you know, when, when it gets in the hands. It also illustrates the need for collaboration between the three orders of government. Agriculture, the agriculture sector is closer to the land. They depend on the land. They, they'll, they'll participate. We need to hear their voice. We need to bring it forward. We have to be supported by facts and data. And then we look at rainforests and the Amazon. We look at what's happening globally. There's bigger picture in, in, than Alberta or Canada. But again, if we establish best practices here in our backyard, right here in Alberta, right here in Canada, it'll be a, it'll be a source of pride for us as a nation. It'll help the world move forward and it'll provide opportunities. And again, our people will, will prosper and want to keep living in, in our province and in our country. And that's what the future is. It's all about people. It's about environment. And it's about uh, getting into the people that know it the most. And I, I, um, it's easy to vilify industry, I know. But uh, I think our agriculture sector should be listened to. But we should look at it objectively. And I'll do so. And I'll bring it forward. And I'll be the strongest advocate you can imagine in cabinet, hopefully, for, for that voice. Thank you. All right, Edward. Yeah, so kind of a two-part question. Will we eliminate subsidies uh, to uh, agricultural corporations? Yes, but will we transfer it to um, another industry? The answer is no. But what we will do, and it's outlined in our platform, there is a broad uh, tax cut for all businesses in Canada. And so, you know, um, these uh, subsidies, these uh, uh, this corporate welfare um, costs Canadians five to $10 billion every year. And uh, it's been going on both under the Liberals and the Conservatives. And, uh, and of course, uh, that's why they have the same top donors. And, uh, you know, uh, we do not believe in government picking winners and losers. We believe in uh, even playing field for all players. And uh, that means uh, ending all corporate welfare and, uh, uh, and with those savings, it's, uh, it's, it's a neutral policy, um, tax neutral, and we can reduce taxes for all businesses uh, with those savings. All right, thank you for that. I'll move to the next question we have in the chat bar. This one was specifically directed at um, Edward Yao. Um, you had mentioned in your um, in one of your points that natural gas was uh, cleaner in its combustion than coal. Um, it's often very dirty, however, in the production. Um, do you support reductions in fugitive methane emissions that are associated with natural gas production? Sorry, what was the question? Do I support uh, reductions in methane emissions that are associated with the production of natural gas? Well, again, uh, you know, methane emissions, um, that's a greenhouse gas. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, broadly speaking, our policy, our party does not have, um, um, uh, we aren't proposing um, large reductions in greenhouse gases. So uh, we're, what we're focused on are pollutants, right? And uh, we're talking about, uh, uh, you know, uh, nitrous oxides and uh, you know stuff that creates acid rain uh, we're talking about uh, toxic heavy metals and uh, you know a lot of the stuff that Natalie has uh, mentioned previously and that's really the focus of our platform so fugitive methane emissions is not uh, high on that priority list all right thank you um, this next question, um, I'm just going to, it's got a bit of a preamble to it. Um, most countries agreed in 2015 in Paris to reduce, um, reduce levels from 1990 CO2 emissions, uh, 1990 CO2 emissions by 50%. Um, but it, in, in these platforms from the, both the Green Party and the Liberal Party, um, they keep, we keep hearing um, reductions from 2005 emission levels. Um, using the 1990 emission levels would mean we'd have to have a larger cut in emissions as we move towards the 2030 and 2050 targets. 
Um, the, the person who asked this question was curious why we use 2005 numbers rather than 1990 emissions numbers. Uh, it was directed at both the green and the liberal candidates. Um, Murray, do you want to start this one? Well, again, like a lot of these questions, it's totally tied to some complex international negotiations positions that we're working as part of a global community to meet global standards. And as Canada, we want to set the highest standard we can as a nation. So that's definitely clear in our platform. It's 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 one of the clean. It's one of the main planks of our platform. Again, I'd ask everyone to look at our website to see our specifics on it. But we're totally committed to being aggressive to meet our targets. And if we do so, that's an opportunity for Canada, where we can once again lead the world and be proud of it. And we have nothing to be ashamed of at the moment. But we can do more, and we're committed to doing more. And, to, and I'll be bringing that voice loud and clear. I've looked at the NDP platform as well, and I totally agree what they say on it as well. So as I say, there's room for, 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 for us to move together as allies, whether it's in Calgary, whether it's in Alberta, whether it's in Canada, on the world stage to help us show, put our best foot forward as a nation. Thank you. Um, Natalie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are international agreements. So the these are recommendations about what we need to do by the International Panel on Climate Change and uh, where they where their modeling sees us and how we have to reduce emissions. So um, they're recommending 60% reduction by 2030. And frankly, we should be moving faster than that. Um, but that's a minimum of where we need to get to by 2030. So um, it is ambitious. And, and um, the reason we need to get there, and I see you're doing the math that it says, uh, someone's mentioning that 61% from 2005 emissions. Um, we would like to go further and faster than 60%. But these are based on international treaties. So it it makes it easier to know what everybody is talking about when we look at the same time frames. Uh, I dare say in, in um, you know, previous targets, they thought that we would have more progress by this time, but this is where we are now. And I think the important thing is with this target is, I mean, whatever target you have, you actually have to have a plan to meet it and you have to be held accountable for it. And you need to be monitoring your progress as you go. And the concern is that Canada doesn't have, I mean, we have an accountability act, but um, the first milestone is really far out and we need something much sooner to see that we're taking more immediate action or we're not gonna be able to meet these targets. Edward, did you wanna to respond to that as well? Yeah, I just want to, if I could have a, a quick input here. So, you know, these uh, um, um, targets, right, to reduce uh, uh, emissions, uh, it's a top-down approach. And, you know, these climate scientists, they may know their, their uh, models uh, very well, but we have to take into account uh, in a global context the economics of the situation. And if we are looking at reducing emissions globally, uh, again, I want to reiterate, it's much more effective if we uh, uh, help these big emitters like China and India uh, transition to a cleaner fuel like greenhouse, uh, like um, uh, natural gas rather than uh, their coal, uh, uh, predominantly coal fueled uh, uh, energy production. So, you know, in the global context, I think that it, it doesn't really make sense, again, for Canada to focus on reducing our emissions when we make up so so small of a percentage of global emissions. And we can do a lot to, uh, to uh, help these other uh, uh, countries reduce their emissions if that's, that's the goal, you know. Thanks, Edward. All right. Um, we'll move on to the next question that was in the chat. Um, this one, all right. Uh, what was your party's response when the RCMP used pepper spray on peaceful land defenders opposed to logging old growth forests at Ferry Creek, BC? Um, let's, who started the last round? Maybe Edward, do you wanna start this round? Yeah, sorry, could you repeat the question? I, I didn't yeah. catch the uh, details there. Yeah, what is your party's stance or what was your party's response uh, when the RCMP used pepper spray on peaceful land defenders opposed to the logging of old growth forests at Ferry Creek, BC? Okay, yeah, um, you know, I'm not really familiar with that particular incident. 
Um, but, uh, you know, when we're talking about uh, uh, projects that have been approved through uh, the appropriate regulatory process uh, and through the appropriate consultations, then, uh, you know, uh, then there's, uh, there's trespass uh, issues uh, at hand here if, if um, these protesters are directly in the, the way of this development. Now, there's, uh, of course, appropriate ways to protest and uh, uh, action through the courts of law if that's what uh, the protesters want to take. But, uh, um, you know, I would, uh, I would say that, uh, you know, in general, halting projects through uh, trespass isn't uh, legitimate. I wouldn't endorse that. But, uh, you know, of course, I don't know the particulars of the situation, but uh, appropriate uh, force, of course, needs to be used. Um, so I'll, I'll just end it at that. How about we go to Natalie next? So that is the, um, the largest act of civil disobedience in Canadian history. There's almost 900 people arrested uh, for trying to protect the old growth forest out there. And, um, you know, First Nations are concerned about this, and so so are others, and they've gone there to protect it. And I think sometimes civil disobedience is absolutely appropriate. I mean, are you going to litigate this, you know, over a period of years, and by that time all these trees are cut down? I mean, the provincial, the, the BC provincial government said that they would protect this area. They didn't, and so people have to take it into their own hands. They are they are uh, protesting nonviolently, and they are being arrested. Um, so you know. <laughs> Um, I applaud people for standing up for their beliefs because if they didn't, those trees would be gone. All right, um, Murray now. Yes, I, uh, there definitely is a time for civil disobedience. And again, like most, uh, most areas, they're not, there's complexities involved. You have to find the right balance. I think we'll find that when it came to the, the party itself, the Liberal government intervened in the case of the hereditary chiefs uh, when, they were, when they were involved with their protests. And um, lo and behold, the, a solution was reached that satisfied everyone. The hereditary chiefs were engaged going forward and a solution was found. At the same time, there is a reaffirmation in rule of law. And it also was a reaffirmation in the need for civil disobedience and being heard and respecting those rights. So I, for one, was, I've been totally impressed with the Liberal government and how it's intervened because we believe in people, we believe in inclusivity, and we believe in rights of people, especially the rights of our Indigenous people. And I think our track record stands out for, for doing so, unlike many of the provincial governments that have not not acted accordingly. Within the RCMP itself, of course, there's, there's reviews going on and those are called for and, and uh, need to be on because uh, the, the RCMP itself cannot be racist. It cannot, uh, it cannot uh, be arbitrary. And I'm comforted that, that, um, that, that that's being, that, that the, the needed, the long overdue reforms are taking place and that culture has to keep improving. And I want to make sure that Thank you. Thank you, Murray. Next question. This is again for all candidates. Um, studies have shown that clear cutting of forests can result in as much or more greenhouse gas emissions than fossil fuel or as fossil fuels. Uh, would your party be willing to transition the forest industry like you plan to transition with oil and gas? Um, I think, Murray, do you want to go first this time? I think we've done, there's, if you need me to repeat the question, I can repeat it again. Uh, please repeat. Yeah, studies have shown how that clear cutting forests can create as much or more greenhouse gas emissions as fossil fuels. Would your party be willing to transition the forestry industry um, like you were planning to transition the fossil fuel industry? Uh, the short answer is yes. I think there's best practices once again. There's responsibilities. There's I look even around like around the oil sands in northern Alberta, where the, uh, the local indigenous uh, groups have been involved with the reforestation efforts, and there's safe practices going on there that have 
that are improving that and it's showcasing what can be done when there's collaboration. The forestry industry uh, in other provinces has taken some lead with best reforestation practices. So yes, for, for transition, yes, it should be based on best practices. The best practices in the world definitely aren't what's taking place in the Amazon. We know that much. Thank you. Uh, Natalie. Hmm. Well, first, I just have to say, we have massive problems with the oil sands. Like, <laughs> they're not well managed. I mean, we've got massive tailings lakes. They, I wouldn't even say tailings ponds, lakes. Um, they were supposed to know what to do with these a long time ago, develop technology, and they're just there. They are prone to leakage. Some of them are going to be released into the main water systems. Like, we have a major problem with oil sands. And yes, forestry, we, we are going really reliant on trees as being uh, a land sink. And um, with climate change, I mean, these, we have to manage our forests, not just, first of all, absolutely not clear cut them. I mean, that that is just a terrible idea to clear cut them. Um, we need to be managing our forests very, very carefully. And, um, you know, using indigenous knowledge and, and working with those who know how to manage forests properly, clear cut should be out of the question. And, and what happens now is with climate change, we're having forest fires and these trees are emitting even more carbon. You know, they're like carbon bombs. And this is also a result of poor forest management. So um, <laughs> there's a lot that we need to be doing with our forest and we need a national forestry strategy. It needs to be focused on. And, you know, just like with anything with climate change, you need all levels of government um, that play a role to be there, including Indigenous peoples, young people. Um, we all have to be talking about this. And I don't have all the answers. I'm not an expert. There are people who are experts in this, and we need them there. And, that, and again, that means we need to make sure we are making sure that our best minds get to go to university to study this and don't have barriers of um, tens of thousands of dollars of debt um, piling up. And so we need to help our students. We need to get everyone together at the table and we need to solve this. It's very clear what we need to do. The science is very, very clear. Thanks, Natalie. Um, Edward. Yeah, so another question uh, relating to greenhouse gas emissions, uh, you know, is that yes, the climate is changing. And uh, of course, some humans have some uh, impact uh, uh, relating to that. But, uh, you know, does that mean we have to stop all development? No, it doesn't. Uh, and uh, um, if we're looking at transitioning um, the um, uh, logging industry like oil and gas, uh, if that means eliminating it gradually, I don't think that's the uh, uh, solution. Um, if uh, it means responsible uh, use, I think that, yes, absolutely, we're on board with that. Um, and again, you know, just like our oil and gas industry, if we're pushing demand to countries with lower environmental and ethical standards, that's not really a good solution in the global context. You know, um, uh, even though the intentions are there, it doesn't work. So uh, it doesn't solve the problem. And, um, and so um, with forestry, yes, we would look at uh, responsible uh, use. All right, thank you, Edward. Next question. How do your parties uh, promote job creation uh, within your environmental platforms, acknowledging the need to transition um, due to climate change and the biodiversity crisis? Um, how do your parties seek to promote jobs while addressing those issues? Um, we'll go back to Natalie to start here. Yeah. Um... So green innovation is what we call it. And uh, I just want to let people know there's now there's now a field called transition engineer. We just have a lot of oil and gas engineers. Now there's transition engineer because we are going to need to transform our entire economy, uh, the way that our industries operate, the materials that we use. Uh, it's going to um, affect everything and vehicles, fuels, everything. There is going to be no shortage of jobs in, um, in our transition. Um, renewable energy is part of that, but there's also transportation and land use and agriculture and all the things that we've been discussing. Buildings um, is a huge one, how we build. So um, in terms of protecting workers, um, there th obviously we're, we're in Alberta. There's a lot of people who are working in the uh, fossil fuel sector, and we are going to um, 
what the Greens would like to do is introduce a Just Transition Act as soon as possible. We'd like to even do this before the end of the year um, that takes care of workers and communities in transition. And so um, what this would mean is going uh, through retraining programs for those who want to do that, but there could also be wage insurance for people who don't and early retirement plans. Um, but there's a, just a tremendous number of jobs in the clean, uh, clean tech sector. But as I mentioned, agriculture, land use, um, buildings, there's, there's a ton of work to be done. But I think what we need is to, you know, first of all, make it a priority and to work towards our targets, we are going to need people in those roles and having that education. So it's going, it needs to start from post-secondary, it needs to be in trades. Uh, we need to make it a real focus. So there's plenty of opportunity for green innovation and um, opening up green jobs training and a, a youth climate core so that they can work in ecosystem restoration and um, and also we need to look at people who are displaced or severely affected um, by, by different uh, aspects of climate change and even COVID. So there are a lot of jobs out there once we make the push to make this happen, but we need to see some urgency around this. All right, thanks Natalie. Um, let's do Edward as our next speaker. Yeah, so <clears throat> in terms of, um, um, uh, the economy, <clears throat> um, economy growth, what we're lo looking at, and, uh, uh, you know, I'm monitoring the chat, people are asking, what do I mean by economic development? Um, it, it means uh, investment, it means productivity growth. And uh, um, if we keep uh, making it costly and difficult to uh, do business and, and live in Canada, then that's uh, hampering economic development. And so, um, you know, a lot of uh, our policies at the People's Party is geared at um, reducing those barriers, reducing the, the cost and uh, um, uh, unnecessarily, unnecessary regulations for investment and, and, um, and business. And uh, so, you know, part of that is clearly defining jurisdiction. What we've seen over the multiple decades is an overreach of the federal government into uh, provincial jurisdiction. And uh, so, um, you know, that creates a lot of investor uncertainty. It creates a lot of issues um, uh, uh, for businesses and uh, individuals. And uh, uh, we need to reestablish, re delineate the, uh, the uh, jurisdiction of uh, provincial and federal governments. Um, but also reducing costs. So, you know, as I mentioned, uh, the People's Party uh, proposes to eliminate corporate welfare, reduce all taxes, reduce taxes for all businesses, and on top of that, uh, simplify the tax code for individuals and reduce taxes for, for all Canadians as well. And um, um, Edward, I think we lost, uh, I was just, uh, we lost our timer and I, I oh, was just keeping sorry, track as we went over. So, okay. um, I see it's back, but if it, I'll just keep a, a tab on my on my phone while we're doing this until it's uh, back in action. And so now, Murray, if you'd like to speak on that. Oh, uh, there Thank we go. You. You're on. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I think you got me now. So first of all, um, there's an urgency required. There's an urgency of climate action, and the, and there's an urgency for job creation. And there's by investing in people, we'll deal with that urgency. And I know, I just know it's in our budget. We have the funds. And I can tell you that um, in terms of an tangible example is our prime minister who invested, committed to the Green Line program, um, who needs in Calgary recently. It's in, it's in the budget. For the own, we're the outlier once again. The, the, the Conservative Party, Mr. O'Toole and Mr. Weber, don't even understand that it's the Liberal Party of Canada and it's Prime Minister Trudeau. And it's myself having my voice already within that group. That's why Calgary's Green Line is moving forward. So I've congratulated the city for doing that. And that's, that's green. It's, it's going to be a model for, for green, that, the operation of the sea train. It's going to have the rail cars and operations that are green. And you know what? It's going to bring the whole of Calgary to the University of Calgary. You know what? 
we have three universities, we have three healthcare, uh, three hospitals in our riding at Calgary Confederation. We have to invest in people to do that. You know what? We've got, we've got to have childcare. We've got to have $10 affordable childcare so people can go to the University of Calgary or to uh, the Univer uh, University of the Arts or to St. Polytechnic and get the skills they need to transition in this economy. And you know what? Um, those jobs on the Green Line, they're providing jobs right now. There's going to be transit-oriented development around the Green Line, and that's going to be good for immediately. It's going to be jobs, and it's going to foster the growth of innovation. And innovation is one of the key planks of the University of Calgary, and uh, we certainly support that plank, and we've said it publicly. We've endorsed the, the, the paper that the University of Calgary... Murray, we've, uh, we've reached a time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, another question for all candidates here. Um, what is your vision or your party's vision for Alberta in a carbon constrained world? What does a prosperous and sustainable Alberta look like in five to 10 years? Um, Edward, do you want to start this one off? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, in terms of uh, um, um, uh, greenhouse gases, Again, I think Alberta and in fact Canada's role is uh, if, if we're looking at reducing greenhouse gases, um, exporting our energy. So, uh, you know, in five to 10 years, we're still going to see most of the population on Earth uh, living in developing countries and uh, underdeveloped countries. And, uh, um, you know, if we look at the World Health Organization, even there's a uh, almost 4 million people every year die because they're burning uh, biomass, biomass. So it could be wood or, uh, you know, uh, or, uh, um, you know, animal uh, excrements. And this is to cook, right? So, so these people live in uh, energy poverty and uh, they're dying because of uh, um, air pollution inside their homes. And uh, so if we're looking at uh, a cleaner environment for people, uh, I think it's important that uh, uh, we continue to provide uh, uh, energy that is abundant here in Canada to the world and uh, um, uh, raise their standards of living so that, uh, so that we can uh, um, address the environmental pollutants that uh, are uh, you know, uh, really uh, uh, big issues in these countries and, of course, in Canada as well. Thanks, Edward. Um, Murray, do you want to do you want to go next? Please repeat. Yeah, of course. One sec. Sorry, I've just been monitoring the chat. I just have to scroll back up. <laughs> So what is your, your vision or your party's vision for Alberta in a carbon constrained world? What does a prosperous and sustainable Alberta look like in five to 10 years? Alberta and Calgary and all of Alberta will be a jurisdiction and a city built on communities that, uh, that will provide, a, but will have invested in people where young families will stay, generations will stay, they'll put their roots down you know, and, and uh, in, in Calgary and in Alberta and in Canada, but specifically in Calgary Confederation, because we have three hospitals, we have, we have uh, three advanced education centers, they'll choose to make their homes here. And it'll be a diversified economy that's safe, that their people can prosper, affordable housing, where working mothers can, can go out and join the workforce. We'll have, a, we'll have affordable housing, we'll be safe and green and clean, and we'll be proud to live here, and we'll be a diversified economy. The innovation initiatives that are taking place at the University of Calgary and elsewhere throughout our community will have produced results, and they get there by investing in people and providing the kind of a community where we can stay in our homes, we can serve the world. Companies like ATCO, um, others that are progressive, and tuned into what it takes to prosper will do so. The city of Calgary, our largest employer, second largest employer, the University of Calgary itself, they get it, they're tuned in. They're gonna be the basis for our future. I'll be proud, I'm no spring chicken as you all know, but I believe in our future and that's why I'm running. It's for the future for young families who will choose 
to make Calgary and Alberta their home. And there's nowhere more than in Calgary Confederation where that, where that should happen and will happen. And that's not top down, like somebody said earlier, that's bottoms up. That's voices I've been hearing for months now, going door to door. And it's a universal voice as I go throughout our communities within Calgary Confederation. That's what people want, whether they live in Renfrew or Tuxedo, whether they live by the university area, whether they live in Crescent Heights, or whether they live in all parts of our community. Uh, Bridgeland is a great example again. It's universal throughout. So that's what I'm hearing, and that's what I'm fighting for. Thank you, Murray. All right, Natalie, you're up next. Oh, she's on. Uh, we need somebody out. To, uh, there we go. I got it. I'm on the button. Thanks. Um, so this is something that I've been really, really concerned about um, the future of Alberta. I grew up here. I'm raising a family here. I have young children. And so something that I initiated with other leaders in Alberta is something called Drawdown Alberta. And it's based on Project Drawdown, which um, was a project by Paul Hawk, which essentially brought together hundreds of scientists to um, derive the most impactful and feasible climate solutions to, to achieve drawdown, which is when our concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, greenhouse gases, starts to decline. And there are hundreds of solutions in, in what I've mentioned before, energy, uh, transportation, industry, buildings, food, agriculture, land use, materials, a lot of other things, as well as land sinks. Um, we also, you know, there's engineer, coastal, um, soil, trees, all of these are sinks. And the way that I envision it, and this is also in the context of, we know in the last couple of years, we've had a very significant exodus of young people from Alberta, which deeply concerns me, especially when we do have post-secondary here, why are they leaving? Because we have really old fashioned thinkers and our government is, is like really in the dark ages that they are not facing the reality of climate and that we are going to be karma constrained. So what we did with Drawdown is we are taking all of those solutions that were um, arrived at by Project uh, Drawdown and we are putting this through an Alberta lens. We are looking at what's the most feasible and impactful climate, climate, solutions, climate solutions in Alberta and what are the, um, what's the education that our young people need to work in, uh, move into those areas? Uh, what are the careers in those areas? Let's make them happen here. Let's turn this around. Yes, it's going to be carbon constrained, but let's make those uh, opportunities. I call them climate positive careers and climate positive jobs. We have to be moving on this. Honestly, this shouldn't be left up to individual students. Our government should be helping with this and resourcing this, but we're making it happen in absence of that mandate. All right. Thank you, Natalie. Um, all right. So just to be cognizant of timing here, uh, we're at quarter two and another round of questions and answers would take us to about 851, 852, um, depending on how long it takes me to do this. Uh, I'm just curious, we still have to have time for closing remarks. If people don't mind being a bit after nine, we can do one more question or do you wanna move into closing remarks? I know people have places to be, it's a, it's a Wednesday evening. So I just wanna make sure if you guys want one more question or closing remarks. Um, Murray, I'd prefer closing remarks as per the schedule if we could. Okay, then we will stick to the schedule. Um, Judy, did we have a, an order for closing remarks or do we just want to go just into any candidate? I can't remember. Yeah, I think we can uh, we can just go uh, any candidate, uh, Philip. So, yeah. Um, uh, well, Murray, why don't you, you start us off? Uh, we're, we're giving you each again two minutes uh, for closing remarks and um, yeah, you can you can kick us off. Thank you. Well, let me start where I started. I, I really hope. Uh, that uh, our NDP candidate, Grishma, I hope she's health is recovering, that we'll see her at the university on Friday at, at noon for the debate there. I look forward to continuing the dialogue there. And so it's an important question and it's a respectful discussion. And uh, I appreciated the opportunity to uh, meet so many of my fellow candidates tonight. And again, thank you for, 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 for making this happen and hope you can continue this for years to come. Uh, and as I said at the start, for the full text of what uh, the Liberal Party of Canada and I personally stand for, please see the media release I posted this afternoon and it was posted uh, at 1 p.m. 
Please see that it's been posted. Uh, take the time to read it. As again, um, simply put, the Conservative Party of Canada and the UCP simply don't seem to recognize the magnitude of the climate crisis, nor do they understand the urgency of climate action. Um, so my promise, as I said, is to be a strong and effective voice for all of us in Ottawa. So let's move forward, not backwards. And let's move together. Let's move together as a community. Let's move together as progressive parties allied with the core values. We'll have differences around the timing of making transition, but let's ensure that we are in the room and that we bring that forward together. And I'm committed, as I said, whether you vote for me or not, I'm going to be a strong voice for everybody in Calgary Confederation. And that's, uh, that's important for today. It's important for tomorrow. And it's definitely imperative for generations. So let's get on with it with some urgency. I appreciated meeting all of you. And I look forward to a continued dialogue. Thank you very much. And I look forward to Friday. Thank you, Murray. All right, Edward, uh, Gal, we'll hand, hand things over to you for your closing remarks. Yeah, thanks, Judy. So um, in closing, uh, you know, I'd uh, encourage everyone to take a look at the People's Party of uh, uh, Canada platform. But in terms of the environment uh, in particular, you know, I think I provided a different uh, perspective and maybe not one that uh, uh, a lot of people here agreed with, but I think it's an important perspective. And uh, especially in the global context where uh, five to 10 years from now, most uh, uh, countries will um, still be on coal. So that's an important, uh, you know, uh, uh, point that we have to, uh, you know, uh, we have to realize. And so in terms of a cleaner environment, we're looking at the single most uh, um, uh, potent tool for um, uh, environmental uh, uh, pollution is economic development. And if we're restricting investment and responsible development in Alberta and, uh, um, and Canada, that means uh, uh, that's detrimental to Alberta and uh, globally the, the environment. And so, uh, you know, I think that we need to reject uh, uh, climate alarmism and uh, the call for uh, drastic uh, elimination of uh, industries uh, in Canada. And uh, we need to focus on pollution. Uh, addressing pollution uh, is uh, the uh, top priority uh, on the environment for the People's Party. And uh, so that means uh, cleaner air, cleaner water and soil, and uh, of course, uh, clean drinking water for First Nations communities. And uh, on First Nations communities, of course, uh, reforming uh, the relationship between the government and our First Nations communities, including repealing the Indian Act. And uh, um, I'll uh, close off at that. Thank you, Edward. All right, Natalie Odd. Thank you. So um, with regard to climate change, I, I'm, not, I'm not really going to <laughs> delve into what Edward's talking about because basically his party doesn't think that climate is human cause, but um, it appears the conservatives don't really think that either because they don't have a mandate to fly, fight climate action. So it's not a wonder that Len wasn't here today because he wouldn't have much to say. But I also want to say we have a big, big problem with uh, what is called the new climate denialism, which is what the Liberal Party is doing. And it is incrementalism. And it, it lulls you into believing that they're doing something, that they really care, they know what's going on. And then year over year over year, you, fit, you discover that nothing's being done. So late, recently, they um, enacted C12, the Canadian Net Zero Accountability Act. Uh, it does not have a carbon budget in it, which is a massive oversight compared to legislation in other countries. You need that level of specificity to gauge progress. Um, the reporting requirements and milestones are way out. The next one is 2030. We're supposed to already have uh, reduced emissions by 60% at that time. And they wouldn't say, oh, whoops, we missed another target. So where's the accountability there? And something that's extremely concerning is that it's not an, a binding legislation, which means the next government could come in and repeal it. And 
what does uh, Mr. Trudeau do but call an election, a totally unnecessary one after they've just passed this legislation after a ton of hard work, and now the Conservative government could come in and just repeal it? So, I mean, what a colossal waste of time, and that is, you know, hugely impactful and dangerous vis-a-vis -vis climate. Um, also, they do not make specific reference to the United Nations direct a declaration on the uh, rights of Indigenous people in the Climate Act, which is another glaring error. Um, we have a ton of political barriers to, to achieving climate action, inequality, job insecurity, regional differences. Um, these all block progress and par paralyze action and foster fear of transition. Um, and, and we cannot overlook the fact that there is a massive, powerful oil and gas lobby that is definitely entrenched with the traditional parties, with the conservatives, with the liberals, working away there with with uh, influencing them and lobbying them and having a ton of meetings with them. And you can't convince me that that does not slow down action. It most certainly does. And that's what makes us cynical and believe that we can't work to, I need 30 more seconds, that we do have the collective power. We have the creativity, the ambition, the imagination to do this. We need to have the mental and emotional fortitude to make this happen. And lastly, we are going to rely on our indigenous peoples here. And they're not, our, they're our brothers and sisters, people we need to work with, our partners, nation to nation. And we've enacted atrocious acts on them with the residential schools and missing and worded women inquiry and all the things that we haven't done so far with truth and re reconciliation and all the calls to action, the recommendation. We need to, we need to come through and do what's been recommended and the calls to action because it is just too much to ask of them that all of the trauma that has been inflicted on them, that they also are going to now to step up and do climate action. There's tremendous Indigenous leaders in climate action, but we need to help them in every single right. way that we have. Um, I think Murray felt do we have to give yeah, one I think, order, yeah. short for time, but sure. Order, if you, if the you last just have 30 speaker seconds went on there, Murray. Two extra minutes, point of order. Yeah, no, that's okay, Murray. You can, uh, if you would like to speak. I don't want to, I just point of order. If you looked at the rules for the debate, Point of order is when someone goes over the time limit right. and the yeah. chair, I think, should call them on a point of order. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, well, I think that brings us to the end of tonight's debate. I feel like we had a, a good, fulsome conversation about you know, a variety of uh, topics uh, that were obviously of really big interest to all of you. So, Philip, I know that the, the event will be has been recorded, of course, and is there a way in which people might be able to access it later on? Yeah, I'm not sure how it will be. It will be shared. It's been recorded. The 100 debates organizers um, Canada wide asked that um, it be recorded just in case someone wasn't able to attend, um, that they would still be able to, to view the debate if needed. Um, I, I'll say some closing remarks, though, before we wrap up, Judy. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, in the spirit of reconciliation, AWA just wanted to recognize that um, we're holding this debate on the traditional territories of the Black Con Confederacy, the Tutina, the Stony Nakoda the Métis Nation Region 3, and all those who make their homes on Treaty 7 um, in this region of Southern Alberta. We thank the Treaty 7 nations for their stewardship commitments and look forward to increasing their role and responsibility in building a more sustainable future here in Alberta and Canada, uh, in Canada nationwide. Uh, I also want to say that on behalf of AWA, I'd like to thank the candidates who participated tonight. Um, and sort of want to recognize that Gulshan Actor from the NDP couldn't be here. And I apologize to Kevin Hunter uh, from the Marxist-Leninist -Lenin Party. Um, he, he introduced himself at the start of the debate. Um, we were just unaware that he was in the writing when we sent out invitations, and I apologize. Um, I'd like to thank our moderator, Judy Aldis, um, for being here tonight to help us out. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. Um, these debates are important, and they don't function without a, without a good moderator. So. Um, we really appreciate that. Uh, I'd like to thank all of our attendees who attended as guests. Um, all of you turned in virtually. I know nowadays everyone's sort of stuck to screen, so we still appreciate you giving us some time in your evening to attend, especially, you know, people not just in the riding, but Calgary-wide, Alberta-wide, or across Canada, there are people tuning in, so we really appreciate that. Um, and I'd like to thank the rest of our AWA staff who made today possible. So everyone who's helped with the technical details and just organizing the evening. Um, thanks again to everybody. All right. Have a good night and good luck, everybody.